Հայաստանի Հանրապետության գիտություն ռազգային ակադեմիայի հարգելի փոխնախագամ հարգելի գործ ընկերներ սկսում ենք գիտաժողովը որը նորված է Սեբրի պայմանագրի կնքման We hereby begin the forum dedicated to the centenary of the signing of the Treaty of Sevres 100 years ago on this date the government of the Ottoman Turkey and uh, the Allied States signed an extensive treaty which addressed among other things the Armenian question. Turkey recognized the Republic of Armenia and as an intermediary proposed to Woodrow Wilson, the President of the United States, to draw the boundaries of future independent Armenia. The boundaries would lie through Erzurumban, Bitlis, and Trabizon Vilayet. Woodrow Wilson adopted the arbitral decision on the borders but on November 22, 1920 and then the Treaty of Sevres the under these boundaries was not delivered, was not implemented. But the fact remained Eight hundred seventy five years after the fall of the Armenian state, and five hundred forty five years after the fall of the Kingdom of Cilicia, it was internationally recognized that Armenian people have the right in their historic land, in the Armenian mountains to recreate independent states. This phenomenon has key value as recognition of the sovereign rights of the Armenian people and their historic territory. And it was a very encouraging fact for solving the Armenian question. But on Subsequently, the provisions of the treaty were not implemented. Our history studies have constantly focused on this issue. Lots of research has been dedicated to this issue. And now, a hundred years passed. Once again, an attempt is being made to look at the philosophy of the Treaty of Sev and also the reasons why it was impossible to implement it. However, Sevres lives, it has not been forgotten, and we hope that a historic situation will emerge in which this issue will, after all, be addressed, will be solved. The speeches of this forum are going to be dedicated to these very issues and identifying ways of defining the meaning of this treaty. And to try to see what geopolitical risks currently exist in light of Sevres, uh, which may uh, pose a threat to our nation and how to deal with these threats. Before turning to the reports, we have received uh, a welcome address by the Prime Minister of the country. I will now ask Academic Nuri Shukurian to present the welcome address of Prime Minister Ovinia Nikol Pashinyan to the conference. Address of the Prime Minister Rami Nikol Pashinyan on the centenary of signing of the Treaty of Sev. Dear compatriots, I welcome all participants of this symposium on the centenary of the uh, signing of the Treaty of Sev. I'm deeply grateful for initiating this key event. The Peace Treaty of Sev occupies a significant role 
in modern history of the Armenian people. It remains to the present day a subject for scientific research and analysis. It is therefore crucial that the impartial analysis of our researchers on the events that preceded and followed the signing of this document are made accessible to our people as well as to the wider international community. This symposium serves that very purpose, and I wish success to the proceedings and wish to everyone a fruitful discussion and new important discoveries. The Treaty of Sèvres is a historic fact. It remains as such to date. Why is this document so important for the Armenian people? Why do we still remain focused on it? Well, first of all, the Treaty of Sèvres was signed on the basis of the results of one of the most dramatic chapters of human history, World War I, around two years after the end of it. Just like the Treaty of Versailles established peace in Europe, similarly the Treaty of Sèvres would do the same in the Asia Minor territories belonging to the Ottoman Empire. It would put an end to the suffering and deprivation of the peoples of that region due to the war. It would mark the end of the so-called cursed era. Just like the Treaty of Versailles in Europe, the Treaty of Sèvres would form a new system of interstate relations in the region. It brought in new values and principles, not only for establishing peace, but also justice in Asia Minor. The treaty was prepared on the basis of the most modern ideas of the time. The key principle there was the right of nations to self-determination and equal rights. It would put an end to centuries of slavery imposed by empires and the reward the peoples of the region with the liberty and independence. Moreover, by granting the right to establish nation states in historic territories, the treaty created favorable conditions for the peaceful coexistence of uh, Muslim and Christian peoples in the region and for preserving civilizational diversity and achieving subsequent development of the region. Secondly, the Treaty of Sèvres is an international document that recognized and enshrined the independence of Armenia. The Republic of Armenia acted as a legally equal party to the treaty. Centuries after the loss of independence, the Armenian government for the first time acted with the greater powers to sign an international treaty. The Republic of Armenia would be recognized or was recognized as a fully equal entity in international law and a fully fledged member of the international relations in accordance with the scope of the treaty. The treaty also recognized the contribution of Armenia and the Armenian people in the victory of the Allied States in World War I and in the achievements and establishment of peace. The role of the Armenian people was underlined and properly valued in international relations and in post-war governance of the world. Thirdly, the Treaty of Sev, Article 59, established and recognized the undisputed relationship of the Armenian people to the Armenian mountain area, where for thousands of years, Armenian people were born and built their culture and uh, history and identity. And finally, the Treaty of Sèvres was signed in the aftermath of the uh, Great Armenian Genocide, where the Ottoman Empire was trying to exterminate the Armenian people as a way of solving the Armenian question. The Armenian people had suffered the most cruel and inhuman suffering. The losses were enormous. In a way, the Treaty of Sèvres offered a path for overcoming the consequences of the genocide by creating independent statehood in the natural cradle of the Armenian people as a fair solution of the Armenian question and restoration of historic justice and creating favorable conditions for the economic and demographic uh, development of the potential of our nation for the natural progress of our nation. Now, although the Treaty of Sèvres was not eventually 
uh, delivered, it continues to exist as a historic fact that reflects the path we have traveled for restoring independent statehood. It is our duty to remember it, to appreciate it, and to maintain its meaning. Signed, Nikol Pashinyan. Thank you, Mr. Shukurian. Thank you also to the Prime Minister for his address. We now proceed with the symposium. I believe that the speakers would agree to the following proceeding set of proceedings. Up to 15 minutes. Would that be sufficient for your report? Up to 15 minutes. Okay. It's a very important issue. If you go up to 20 minutes, that's fine. We will now give the floor to academician Ashut Melkonian, director of the History Institute. The topic is the Armenian question in the Treaty of Sevres, history and modern issues. Um, sorry, Mr. Mekonian. One proposal is to take a minute of silence to re in, 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 in respect for the memory of uh, Lebanese people and Armenian people that died in uh, Lebanon recently. Thank you to your attendees. I would like, before turning to my speech, to express my satisfaction with this symposium, especially the fact that uh, are showing an emphatic state-level approach to the Treaty of Sevres. Well, the people were always showing a lack of attention, paid attention, took a little while to come about. This is no longer the monopoly of researchers. It is now a topic that the public are discussing as well. Speaking of the Treaty of Sevres and the Armenian question, of course, historical overview is warranted. It started in the 14th century as the newly created Ottoman Empire, posing a threat to Europe. As it became weaker, Europe was looking for a way to pay back and to bring forward a plan of splitting uh, the Ottoman Empire. The aftermath of World War I was a suitable opportunity for the Allied States, the Entente, to deliver this plan. Speaking of this plan, one first of all has to look at the famous 1916 May Sykes-Picot Treaty. Two diplomats, the English Mike Sachs and the French George Picot, had drafted the, the agreement and soon signed it in London. Foreign Affairs Minister Grain of uh, England and French Ambassador Combo. And this treaty, in a way, was kept secret from Russia, their ally, but after 1916, February, after the famous winter campaign in Erzurum, Russia had major success along uh, the front line in the Caucasus and the Balkans. Thereafter, the Allies rushed to inform Russia about this secret treaty, and soon Russia also joined this treaty. And the requirement was that uh, Constantinople and the Straits, and not just Western Armenia, would be transferred to Russia. And most part of Palestine and Lebanon to France and Baghdad, with its oil, famous oil mines, would uh, be transferred to England. 
this document was published after Russia had the 1917 coup d'etat and the People's Communist Council declared it a part of the robbery treaty and published it, making known with what each um, contracting party would be receiving. And because of that revolution, Russia never took part in the formation of the post-war uh, boundaries and really greatly suffered. World War I ended with the 1918 Compiègne Treaty, but then uh, on October 31, the, with the Mudros ceasefire, the German military, military political group, group's members, including Turkey, admitted defeat, capitulated, and uh, agreed to withdraw its troops to the pre-war 1914 boundaries. And as the Republic of Armenia already existed, as from May 28, 1918, naturally, the Armenian people had suffered great losses in this war, and because of that, the Armenian people had all the rights, military, political, and diplomatic, and could expect anything from that war. So it was decided to send a delegation from the Republic of Armenia to Paris to sign that treaty. And a delegation of Avetis Saharonian and Mikhail Papajanian was created in 1919 on February 4. This delegation arrived in Paris and was there that uh, Catholicus of all Armenians, Gebrug V, had assigned to have Boros Nubar, Egyptian Armenian there. These delegations met. Unfortunately, m there's much discussion in literature that there was acute disagreement between these delegations, that the delegations could not come up with a common plan, but the reality is different. For the achievement of the wishes of the Armenian people, both delegations did their best. And in the harshest of disputes, one side always made a concession to, achieve, to reach agreement. Before the arrival of the official Armenian delegation to Paris, Boris Nubar had worked a lot with the diplomatic circles of the European states. And it's not by coincidence that there was little to be done for the delegation of the Republic of Armenia. The so-called disagreements were soon overcome. On February 25, 1919, the two Armenian delegations came up with a common plan in the conference. And when the big powers' representatives were trying to discuss and understand who they had to deal with, Boris Nubar, to his credit, at the most decisive moment, pointed the finger at Avetis Aharonian and said, this is the one who should represent the Armenian state, understanding that fact. So in historical studies and in political literature, that dispute between the parties is really an exaggeration. And what was the dispute in actuality? What was the dispute about? The Republic of Armenia, with its delegation, it was assumed that would have more moderate demands. That was the opinion of then Prime Minister Kajazuni. And he said, we might give up access to the Black Sea if we find it's not realistic. Bosnubar thought that the Armenian people could demand all the way up to Cilicia from the Black Sea to the Mediterranean Sea, having access to the Black Sea and the Mediterranean Sea. And the parties agreed on that with the agreement of February 25. And it wasn't that the Armenian delegation made a concession, which the literature claims. It was clear that even if that was not realistic, it, with diplomatic demands, 
the modest demands would be granted and uh, the disagreement uh, between the parties, the so-called disagreement between the parties was over that. One of the disagreements was with respect to the name of the uh, Republic of Armenia. Western Armenians, Andranik Bogos Nubar, thought in fact by calling parts of Western Armenia, the Republic of Armenia, it would place all of Western Armenia beyond our entitlement, which was over two-thirds of our historic uh, land. And the, the Republic of Armenia explanation was also logical. It said that by saying Republic of Armenia, they meant not only Western Armenia, and life subsequently showed that the idea of a united Armenia was declared, proclaimed by the government and parliament of uh, the Republic of Armenia on May 28, 1919, in the Act of United Armenia. The memorandum of the Armenian delegation demanded that Turkey would recognize the Republic of Armenia created in Western Armenia with seven vilayets, including Trapizon and the four Sanjaks of Cilicia for at least 20 years. The mandate would be given to one of the allied countries, which would sponsor the Republic of Armenia. The Armenian delegation assumed that it would be much more appropriate to give the mandate to the United States, because Woodrow Wilson was already quite active in that field on January 30, 1919, in a conference in the United States, he had stated, we must do our best to restore justice for Armenian people to have statehood and to, and prompted the idea of United Armenia. So the big powers, too, thought that it is best to get rid of this trouble to them. Armenia would be seen as trouble, as, as, as a headache. The Kemalist movement that that began after the war uh, would need attention. So they thought it would be best to do it through the United States. Especially because on March 20, 1919, the US president had set up a delegation, a group, members of which were Crane and King. They traveled to Constantinople. They worked there for one and a half months and presented an opinion whereby the territory of the, autumn, of the Ottoman Empire in the aftermath of the war, three states would be created. In the western part of the Ottoman Empire, this is Asia Minor, eastern part of Anatolia, the Turkish state with Constantinople, then Eastwards, Armenia state would be created, and the third state would be the state of Pontos, meaning the Greek state. The Pontic state had been there earlier in town. The Commission decided that enormous resources would be necessary, necessary for for the sponsorship of the U.S. at the time, 750 million U.S. dollars and an army of 59,000 that would be able to drive out the Turkish forces from there, including the Kemalists, which were already becoming a reality. The, the Antant re recognized the Republic of Armenia in Yerevan to celebrate the 101 cannons. The U.S. also subsequently recognized the Republic of Armenia, and Armen Karo Karigin Pasturmajan became the first diplomatic representative of Armenia in the United States. And in those conditions, the Senate and Woodrow Wilson had different approaches. Although the Senate members earlier said that with respect to the mandate, they also thought there was no issue, and 
James Harbert's delegation, General James Harbert's delegation, traveled to Asia Minor, went to Western Armenia. Interestingly, in Sebastia, it met with Mustafa Kemal, leader of the Milli movement. And knowing that, he was traveling to Yerevan, proposed to convey to the Armenian government the proposal to start the negotiation on the borders. And in September, arriving to Yerevan, James Harbour informed the Armenian government about it. James Harbour's conclusion, the finding, which presented the whole demographic situation on Western Armenia, the roads, the resources, confronted directly that it was a poor country, and after assuming that mandate, the U.S. would have a serious problem. In its opinions, in its conclusions, it essentially did, in order not to upset the U.S. president, or to justify that approach, so this is a 14th point set of arguments about uh, overtaking the mandate, and 13 points referred to not assuming the mandate. And there was a reason uh, why that prompted the Senate in 1920 on June 1 to vote with a vote of 9.23 to vote to refuse the mandate of Armenia and Asia Minor, saying that this is great trouble, it's a great headache for the U.S., and it makes no sense to assume that mandate. However, the process went on. In April 1920, in Italian San Remo, in Turkey and the victorious states, the great allies, the UK, France, Italy, Japan, and their smaller allies, Belgium, Greece, and the other countries, the newly formed and the delegation of the Republic of Armenia they that conference and its decision subsequently and the latest treaty of self. Obviously, Aronian telegraphed to Armenia that the great powers by uniting the two Armenian states, David Lloyd George, the UK Prime Minister, thought Armenia needs vital conditions to be a vital country and to have lungs to breathe. And it, it was considered that Erzurum would be the heart of the Western Armenia and access to the Black Sea also would be necessary. And the question of Batumi was specifically discussed, which said that Armenia gains the right through Batumi to freely and free of charge gain access to the Black Sea because it had not yet been decided what would happen with Trabizon and for the time being, it was only reference to the Treaty of Batumi. It was only referencing the Treaty of Batumi. Subsequently, another important point of San Remo was the agreement the U.S. would take or assume the mandate but it would be taken on June 1 and it was dropped, uh, dropped from the agenda unfortunately. A lot of other issues was the issue of Armenian Greek relations. The U.S. delegation that worked in Constantinople earlier thought that a Greek state would need to be created. The Trabizon were transferred and the, the idea of creating a Greek state would not be possible. This was described in great detail in his book by Aletis Saharonian from Sevres to Lausanne, which says 
Can you tell us? Finally, considered, and the Greek, uh, brotherly Greek people considered no understanding it's a vital issue for Armenia on the condition that the Republic of Armenia would also respect they would respect the rights of the uh, brotherly Greek people there in Trebizond. In San Remo, there were other important issues were discussed as well, including the future of Lebanon, in order for the one night 2020, the other different a new phase began, and this became a reality on the issue of the borders, neighboring Georgia and Azerbaijan. It was decided that it would happen by joint agreement of the parties, and if that were impossible, then the great powers would need to do this. And it was a provision that subsequently entered the Treaty of Fez. So the Bafo Declaration, based on the Bafo Declaration, it was mentioned that the large powers we need to pr make their contribution to creating a truer state, which they later subsequently managed to do. In French, Paris suburb, the Ottoman government and the UK, French, Italian, Japanese governments, and small allies like Belgium, Greece, Portugal, Romania, Armenia, Czech Republic, Czechoslovakia, Serbia, Croatia signed this treaty. On the Armenian side, it was signed by Amity Saharanian, the head of the delegation, using the pre-ordered golden pen. On the Turkish side, Abdi Pasha General, and by with that, Turkey accepted its defeat. And also the fact of the collapse of the empire, the treaty was an enormously huge text. 500 uh, articles, and they Armenia in particular. Turkey would irrevocably recognize the independence of Armenia as a sovereign state. The US president would define the boundaries. And under Article 89, after defining the boundary, Turkey would thereafter declare that from the date of the decision, it would surrender any legal claims on the territories. Arapakan has written a lot about it. He said that the arbitral uh, decision did not need to be ratified, it became final. From the day on which the US president would present the Armenian Turkish border to the contracting parties, Trabizon, Erzurum, and Bitlis, Van Vilayets included, Armenia would receive almost all of the Erzurum Vilayets, except for a few western provinces. Most part of Trapezon and Van and Bitlis Vilayets, two thirds of the territory of the Republic of Armenia would become 161,000 square kilometers. And the territory of Armenia proper, 70,000 square kilometers would be added, it would become a powerful state, a reliable partner for the European allies. But that idea was not implemented due to a number of reasons, especially the new geopolitical realities. Turkey retains Constantinople, Eastern Anatolia, Turkey would lose Rakia, uh, the, the islands of the Aegean Sea, Cyprus. I mean, you would even gain rights over Izmir, which later changed. In, articles 88, in addition to Articles 88 to 93, there were some other articles and other sections which concerned the Armenian question, like Part 4, Article 142, Article 349, Article 144. Article 142 in Part 4, for instance, is quite important because from November 1, 1914, when Turkey entered the war, 
those two you know, Christians who have become Muslim in Turkey, most of whom, of course, were Armenians, would henceforth, if they wished, immediately again reconvert to Christianity, return to the faith. Besides, the Ottoman government undertook to return their property to the Armenians and others who lost their property. And this important circumstance would uh, remain in the focus of the large powers. The territories that seceded from Turkey would need to have free access to the Mediterranean. If Armenia were to have access to the Black Sea through Trabizon, then it would also have the right to access both for Dardanelle and the Mediterranean Sea. In that sense, Armenia would become a, a marine country, a sea country. As the other presentations, our colleagues, I will stop there. And at the end, I would like to express my satisfaction and say it's very good that the scientific community, it's very important that this key event, constantly receiving attention from the scientific community, is not remaining our monopoly. It's important that our society is also claiming ownership, and today it remains an important legal political foundation of our rightful claims, and as a nation and state, we will fight for it so that we achieve uh, compensation for the Armenian genocide, and that compensation must be not only material, but also territorial. To the comprehensive presentation. I will now give the floor to Academician Ruben Safrastian, Director of the Oriental uh, Studies Institute at the Academy. The topic is Turkey confronting Sevres, historical geopolitical reflections, please. Thank you. The Treaty of Sevres, dear colleagues, is an international document which is closely related to the history of our people. and it must be studied in great detail. We heard Academician Malconian's comprehensive presentation who presented all the events that led to the signing of the Treaty of Sevres. I will now try to take on a different perspective on the problem. I will try to understand and analyze the approach of the Turkish side to the Treaty of Sevres. I think that this is an important issue. This is an important matter. It hasn't been studied enough. Why? Because on the, well, there, are two, there were two Turkish sides here, uh, really two different Turkish approaches here. The approach that uh, prevailed, the Kemalist approach, falsified, rigged history, not just the Kemalist official uh, historiography, rigging the history of neighbors such as us, but also falsifying the history of their own people and of Turkey. So the activities of that second side, the Turkish side, were labeled as treason. All the Turkish politicians who have dealt with the signing of the Treaty of Sevres as representatives of the Ottoman Empire were labeled as traitors and were convicted to sentenced to death penalty. Dozens of people, representatives of the Turkish elites who were sentenced to death penalty, uh, who had in any way been affiliated with the signing of the 
treaty of Serb. Of course, this does not correspond to the reality. I think that they, by, by studying deeper the approach of the Turkish side, we will understand that uh, the Sultanate government and a number of uh, politicians, a number of figures, key figures, key Ottoman figures that had mobilized around it were not treasons to the Turkish people. They were just trying to find an alternative path. They were trying to, in the new world that was emerging after World War One, to take a new, a renewed meaning, to find a renewed role and place for Turkey, not as an empire, which for, had existed for centuries. on the basis of oppression of other peoples, but as a state which, within its national boundaries, within the boundaries of its nation, would confine itself to, wi to its own boundaries and would have decent relations with its neighboring countries that would emerge on the territory of the Ottoman Empire. Such was the substance of that approach which, as I said, unfortunately, the, the official Turkish historiography following Mustafa Kemal's direct instructions falsified it and uh, labeled these people as traitors. One key circumstance here to be borne in mind is that essentially what we're dealing with a phenomenon of the young Turkish movement. It's a mistake to think that the young Turkish movement is only the young Turkish party or elite or Taliyat and Vered Jamal and others. No. The young Turkish movement was a large and extensive, truly extensive movement in the final stage of the existence of the Ottoman Empire and this movement included the most extremist, racist, nationalist uh, minded people in Turkish society back then, and there were very many of them. And the Kemalist movement, and this is something I want to highlight, the Kemalist movement was really the young Turkish movement. We have to make sense of that. Without, making, without understanding that, we will not understand the substance of the Kemalist movement with its activities and with his allies and partners who led that movement, Kemal continues. The Young Turkish Parties, the Young Turkish Movement's plan, and the main purpose of that plan was to annihilate the Armenian people and to annihilate the Armenian statehood. Such was the main purpose of that Kemalist movement. And this is no lip service from me. There is a document which has circulated, secret document, 1920 November, dated 1920 November 8. And this document is, was sent from Ankara. It was back then the capital of the Kemalists to Ka pa Karabekir Pasha, who led the Turkish militia group called Army, but it wasn't Army, it was a militia uh, of murderers, a group of murderers which had entered into Armenia and were in the suburbs of Alexandropol. And it was written with black on white that Armenia must be destroyed in a political sense and in, a, in real terms. And it meant a gen continuation and completion of a genocidal plan. The genocide would need to be carried out against the whole state, and not just Western Armenia. And this was the purpose of the Kemalists. And those people, by coming to the power, subsequently in Turkey, as I said, falsified history. 
But you see, the Kemalist movement, which as I said, was really the same as the Young Turks movement, himself Mustafa Kemal. Mustafa Kemal himself was one of the first group of Young Turks. There's information showing he is also the Tashkilat and Marxist uh, organizations, the organization of the assassins. He was a member of the organization of the assassins and in 1919, in May, he was sent from Constantinople, the capital, to Asia Minor to lead the rebel movement there uh, by the organization Karakul, which is another secret organization of the Young Turks, which had been created in the final months of the war by Taliat and Enver. He had directly been sent there by that organization to go and to carry out their plans. But then, when we look at it, look at the activities of Mustafa Kemal, we see that there was a stage in his work right after the end of the war. For a moment, he started to doubt whether the young Turkish ideas that he professed were viable. He tried to get in touch directly with British intelligence. In modern Turkey, this is something that is almost not discussed, but the fact remains. He came from Syria in October 1920, rather early October. He went from Syria to Constantinople. The very first meeting, he had three meetings on the first day. And the very first one was with a representative of the British intelligence, where he offered his services to the British leadership, to the British intelligence. The British did not take it seriously because at the time, there were many Turkish pashas and generals that were offering their services to the British. The reason I bring it up is to understand well the approach of the Kemalists and that Turkish elite to understand their perceptions. If they are in a difficult situation, they are ready to betray their ideas. And that's important for us to know who we are dealing with. And finally, and I'm not going to details of the activities of the Kemalists, it is quite well researched already. Simply to note here that the Kemalists and Mustafa Kemal had from the very beginning decided to attack Armenia. The Soviet or Turkish historiography that the attack on Armenia occurred because of uh, Sevres is not correct. In February 1920, already Mustafa Kemal had concluded that one should attack and uh, eliminate Armenia. So we are again looking at uh, falsification of history here. It would be interesting in the short time we have to focus on the activities of the group which represented that Turkish side that signed the Treaty of Seville on behalf of the Ottoman Empire. The important thing here is the Young Turks movement. That's the key to understanding the situation. And the group that signed it on behalf of the Ottoman Empire were the anti-Young Turks. Those were people who, for decades, had fought against the Young Turks. And Tamat Ferit Pasha. who was Prime Minister Satraza. He was a famous anti-young Turk. 
the well, same can be said about several other anti young curves. They represented the part of the Turkish elite that were led into nationalist ideas that were so common in Turkey that were instilled by the young Turks. It's understandable that by coming together around Sultan Rais that they, were, they managed to create it's ignored by Turkish history and other facts. But the history, the, the fact is that in, in Constantinople, in the capital of the country, 1918 to 1920, there were a number of organizations, let alone parties, we had the Attila, which was anti-young Turkish, anti-young Turk, that had come together with a number of representatives of the anti-young Turks who thought that Turkey, the Ottoman Empire, had to develop, uh, had the possibility of developing if it could uh, secure They uh, turned to the U.S. for mandate several times, also to England. So that elite which signed the treaty was a part of that movement. That was a sultan that was a man who, back in 1918, in November 2018, admitted officially that Armenians had been, and there were mass killings of Armenians in 1918. This was one of the first people to recognize the fact of the genocide. The representatives of that group, as I said, Ahmad Ferit Pasha, with numerous reports, memos, had contacted the Allies. Some of them were secret, in which they said that they are ready for the Ottoman Empire to give up on its on, on a number of territories uh, all belonging to people under its power rule. And there are different conflicting approaches here. It's clear that they tried. Uh -huh. the Pasha and Tetris Pasha, also Prime Minister later, tried to find a certain path, seek a path to satisfy the Allies and also to the extent possible to create favorable conditions for Turkey in the post-World uh, War world. So I focused on this numerous circumstances and in one of those secret memoirs, Davat Merit Pasha even agrees that a possibility is given to the creation of an independent Armenian state uh, in the territory of the Ottoman Empire, that is to say, on the territory of Western Armenia. But instead, asks Hijaz, the Arabic states, to be in the composition of this state. So this is quite an interesting approach, and this is completely contrary to the approach that was developed by Ataturk. That is to say, to give Arabic nations a possibility to get out of the Ottoman Empire, but to keep Armenia within the Ottoman Empire, as it is stated in the 
uh, national oath, which was authored by Mustafa Kemal Atatürk, in, that was adopted in January 1920 by the last Ottoman uh, parliament. But uh, the sources, Turkic sor Turkish sources, say that this was a cherished dream of Atatürk dating back to 1906. So we see that here we again have conflicting approaches and contradicting approaches. Whatever. It is very interesting to get acquainted with this uh, secret memoirs. And there are quite a lot of formulations that are of, of great interest here. For example, one of those memoirs state that uh, the collaboration of Bolsheviks with the Kemalists is undermining to the reputation and is humiliating to Ottoman Turks because they're collaborating and they're asking assistance from Russian Bolsheviks and that this is not uh, really reputable for Turks. So I am not really focusing on the whole chronological order of the events. However, I would like to say that when time came and uh, the Ottoman Empire was given just one month um, to ratify uh, to, to adopt and to agree to the clause of signing the Treaty of Sevres on July uh, 20th, 1920, a cabinet uh, meeting happened because no, not the Sultan himself or Sadrazam, that is to say, uh, the Prime Minister made uh, individual um, decisions, but uh, the whole uh, government spoke for uh, signing uh, the treaty, but the Sultan was not happy with this. And two days later, the Sultan invited a special Sultan Council. This was the second one in the history of the Ottoman state, and this was where the most important events were being discussed. And 45 representatives from the Ottoman Turkish elite participated in it, including pashas and including a high-ranking military. And 44 out of 45 uh, was for the signing of the Treaty of the Sèvres. And we can see that this was a result of quite serious discussions, a series of such discussions, and quite serious persons, a representative of the elite, participated in it, and later, but they were sentenced to death by the Kemalists. And we can establish it as a fact that the Turkish elite during these years in 1918-1920 was divided, and this fact of division at the demarcation line fell between uh, the two armies of young Turks and non-young Turks. Uh, the non-young Turks, uh, Turk elite, uh, who really fighted and fought and opposed the non-Turkic, um, the young Turk uh, elite, uh, were trying to foster their vision, which were and were trying to see Ottoman Empire as a preservation of caliphate, as a state, as a nation state that was supposed to have uh, normal relations with its neighbors. And if this was really implemented and realized, we would see a completely new Middle East and a completely new Turkey. And now, very briefly, I would like to speak about the uh, uh, events in the recent months, and I will conclude thereby. Uh, so we see that after the Treaty of Sèvres, we have the Lo Treaty of Lausanne, where, they, uh, where Ataturk was able to arrive at new approaches, unlike Sèvres, and this was uh, ma mainly the document that established the frontiers of the current state of Turkey. But of course, decades later, later Erdogan came to power, and he is actually challenging and questioning Lausanne. And uh, there are a number of announcements that he has made that I would like to quote. They, that is to say the West, uh, 
imposed the self on us. We agreed to, to Lausanne, and we are a nation that is being guided by Lausanne, and uh, we are living the pain of our loss. If we stop here, we will have to go back to the clauses and the terms of the Sèvres. Uh, of course, so the logic is clear, and this is when uh, this is said when Turkey is trying to pursue a very aggressive foreign uh, policy, and they send out their military beyond the frontier, and they're being involved and deployed in different military actions. And Turkey is on the verge of making use of uh, deploying its uh, is is at the brink of extend exhausting its possibilities because I don't believe that they will be able to deploy all this military in so many different fronts. And if they don't do it, they will have to, he says, they will force us to come back to serve from Lausanne. Uh, last year, on December 16, meeting, uh, the meeting between Libya and Istanbul uh, was uh, between uh, Saraj, of the leader of Tripoli, and he said, Erdogan said, we broke the Treaty of Sèvres when we signed this agreement with you. That is to say, the signing of an agreement for one of the parties of modern uh, Libya uh, is presented by Erdogan as the break breach of the Treaty of Sèvres, and Mr. Uh, the next speaker will speak in more detail about this, uh, Mr. Hovsepian. And Erdogan said a different thing. Before Lausanne, we had 2.4 million uh, square kilometers, and uh, now we have 780 square uh, thousand square kilometers. And this is quite characteristic to say that a, year, a few years ago, on the day uh, of the death of Ataturk, uh, during his speech, he expressed and put forth the following idea that we have to take charge of our national oath again. That is to say, uh, the frontier for the Turks that was uh, envisaged, that were envisaged by Ataturk, but he was unable to implement and to make happen. So we need to really conclude the realization of the national oath. This is an aggressive statement, and this means aggression to a number of neighboring states. And also, it is really important to see how important it is to modern Turkey uh, to make reference to the historic past. We, this is something we need to mention for us to understand who we're dealing with. The Hagia Sophia the Saint Sophia uh, mosque that was turned into a uh, museum. We had the first uh, namaz, the uh, Muslim prayer happening on the same day, on the day when uh, the Treaty of Lausanne was signed. So here we see certain symbolism behind this act uh, to symbolize the concept that Erdogan put forth that we need to revise Lausanne because we did not really get achieve our ultimate aims because we incurred territorial losses. And this is to symbolize that Turkey is moving ahead and they would like to uh, have territorial achievements achievements at the expense of its neighbors. So this is Turkey in its essence, and this is really dangerous uh, and a threat to both us, to the neighbors, to the other neighbors, and the Turkish people. And of course, in this sense, the Treaty of Sèvres uh, uh, is of paramount importance to us, and I'm convinced that the fight of the people for our great goal, the restoration of the Armenian statehood in our uh, cradle uh, of creation of origin in uh, the Armenian uh, landscape, in the Armenian mountains, is an especially important term and clause within the Sèvres concept. And uh, I'm convinced that time will come when we will really attain this goal of ours. And 
I think it is not going to be easy for us to fight for this goal because we see who is our opponent we're dealing with. It will be a long-term engagement, but I believe that it is really important for us to train and to educate our young people to sustain the attainment of this goal. And this is one of the aims that our uh, conference today serves, uh, serving at the same time another goal to get to the mobilization of all Armenian forces, the Republic of Armenia, the Artsakh Republic, and the diaspora for the sake of the attainment of our ultimate and major goal. Thank you very much, Mr. Zafrastian, for this very interesting report. Uh, truly, uh, you the concept that you put forth were really of paramount importance and worth, uh, worthwhile to take note of. And now I would like to give the floor to Mr. Karen Khachatryan, Deputy Director of the History Institute of the National Academy of Sciences, and the topic is the Treaty of Sava and Russia. Thank you, uh, the dear uh, colleagues, uh, the participants, and dear viewers who are following us on TV and on the Internet. Uh, I would like to congratulate all of us, too, because finally uh, the result of our work and this historic, historically important event, the 100th anniversary of the Treaty of Sevres, can be uh, organized with the participation and with the involvement of our um, uh, population, but also we very much highlight the importance of the announcement made by the Prime Minister on the occasion. But it seems that we do not have an exchange of ide ideas or a Q&A, but I would like to mention that both academicians, Samuel Konyan and Safrastian, in fact, really facilitated uh, the uh, work of the uh, remaining reporters in the sense that we're going to focus not on the general context, but on the specific issues we're going to address. Also, I would like to state that Academician Safrasian was quite right to mention that Turkish historiography has falsified and continues to falsify its own history. However, I would like to add uh, to what my honorable colleague said, stating that it's falsifying not only its own history, but it's also falsifying the history of the nations in the region and the history, uh, the global history. And in this sense, to try and to put, uh, uh, to equalize uh, the Turkish historiography and the modern Armenian historiography would not be right, to put it mildly. And we should not even think about such thing. We cannot, we should not afford to think about it because this can lead us to major losses. Armenian historiographers and history specialists maybe during these years have construed different historic events and have made certain mistakes. But mostly, the Armenian historiography has always been on quite a high level. And once again, I would like to say that we should not even assume that we could put an equal mark between Turkish historiography and Armenian historiography. And from now on, whoever ever speaks about this should think, first of all, if they are capable of thinking, of course. And we Armenians, uh, 100 years later, are really in charge and obliged to do what we have been doing during these years of independence, uh, that is to say, uh, to present the historic past and the lessons of the history as accurately as we can, uh, yes, and including the Treaty of Sèvres. And yes, the Treaty of Sèvres has determined the destiny of our nation. However, we should also take into consideration that the Treaty of Sèvres was an international document, and it had to do with the fate of the destinies of different countries and different states and nations. So I would like to 
speak in more detail the standpoint and the stance of Russia, Soviet Russia. And of course, this has to do with the stance of the Kemalist Turkey, as it was rightly mentioned here by academician Safrastian. However, I will try to show, based on historic facts, the main issue. And I would like to add that this report was also prepared based on the historic and historiographic literature that is existent and our historians of the past generations have made major contribution to and I would like to extend my word of extended gratitude for this. So the World War I that was about the collapse of the old regime of the world had disastrous effect on a number of states and nations, including the Western Armenians, who had undergone different disastrous atrocities. It was also a disastrous for the Russian Empire and its nations. As a result of the revolutions in the Russian Empire, after the collapse of the empire, Russia was really uh, dragged into a disastrous civil war, and the country was really collapsing. Only in 1980, uh, uh treaty, Russia was losing one million square kilometer uh, territory. On April same year, the uh, Transcaucasian Selm that uh, announced um, Transcaucasus as a republic. So separating from Russia, the region, including Armenia, were gradually uh, dragged into the dispute between uh, Turkey and Russia. However, Russia, either Tsarist or Soviet, could not really reconcile to the loss of this strategically important region, a region, a territory which uh, was really important for the Russian Empire. And since 18th century, the Russian Empire had incurred major sacrifices to retain it. If the, the Russia lost Caucasus and First Caucasia, the Russia was really uh, putting on, into, uh, on at peril the existence of its state. And it, we cannot really doubt that uh, if the Armenian and the Armenian state was uh, moved from the uh, map, the great Turan would really devour the major part and territory of, the, of Russia. So uh, the allied states were also for moving Russia away from the region, who in, uh, since 1919 uh, had convened uh, during the Paris um, Peace Conference, and they were, um, they agreed that in case there was a final victory uh, over uh, in the war, they should contribute to the separation of the state, and it should be taken away from the global arena. And of course, the Ottoman Empire would have a very heavy fate. Uh, it would be disrupted and collapsed too, and dismembered too, and the number of nations that have been enslaved uh, by the Ottoman Empire, including the Western Armenians, uh, would have an opportunity to create their independent state. So the new international system, the Versal uh, system, which also in, uh, Ent entailed uh, the Treaty of Sevo was to announce and the declare the creation of a number of independent states, including the Armenian state in the region. And I would like to really stress the most important Black Sea territory, Black Sea region, and the making of the new global order. So a new global order, which would really oust the decisive uh, player in the region, specifically the Russian factor. So it would be very surprising if Russia, even being Soviet Russia, would not be quite determined to act against the new Versailles um, Versa world order and the Treaty of Serka. However, not because it was against the interests of Turkey, but because it was radically against and opposing its own interests 
are not only and not uh, exclusively and largely in the issue of the Armenians. Of course, Russia will find it difficult to admit that Armenia would already receive the mandate and the assistance of the entente countries and uh, respectively, they fall within the scope of the inclusive states. However, Russia was more concerned with the was really concerned with the real and the devastating prospect of being ousted from the Balkans, from Caucasus, from uh, Transcaucasia, etc. So now let's come back to the Treaty of Sèvres and the Straits. So the Straits were supposed to be demilitarized and they were supposed to be put under the control of the Allied powers. So according to the established special policy, the Straits were uh, declared open for both the commercial and the military vessels of the the Allied powers, and it cannot. Be, it was beyond discussion that this this, this uh, status of the strait would put the, the Russian state into a dangerous position because the Allied powers vessels would have uh, open access to the Black Sea with all respective consequences. So the Treaty of Sefa would put. Uh, the Russia, uh, the Russian state outside control of uh, the strait and would deprive it of all its global ambitions. So this is something that was reali realized by the representatives of the tourist Russia uh, who were in Paris, as well as the representatives of the non-state formations within the Russian territory. So in their understanding, the Western Armenia uh, territory and Konstantinopolis were supposed to be transferred to Russia if the Bolshevik regime was uh, rejected and was uh, won. Uh, over in uh, Russia. So the Versailles uh, system and uh, the Treaty of Sèvres became the major point in the foreign policy led by Bolshevik Russia already. And this is how the Kemalist and the Bolshevik anti-imperialist uh, alliance was formed and strengthened. And this is largely within the general political logic because the Treaty of Sèvres was a challenge against the Turkish state, which had uh, uh, hundreds of thousands of military and uh, the motto of the anti-imperialist uh, fight, the Bolshevik and the Kemalist uh, alliance was in fact against Armenia as an ally of the um, Antant powers. So uh, the Soviets uh, already declared Soviet Azerbaijan also supported this situation. And in, uh, in uh, they were very uh, importantly and very interestingly and correctly uh, oriented to support the strengthening of the Bolshevik power and the activity of this alliance in the foreign policy and the fast uh, forwarding and advance of the Red Army. Of course, academicians of Russia said that at the beginning of 1920, the Kemalists intended to, uh, to, to wipe away the Armenian statehood. However, why did they, didn't they do it? Because they expected uh, the assistance of Soviet Russia. Everyone is uh, very well aware of this, and I would not, uh, I don't want to speak about the uh, letter that was written to Lenin by Mustafa Kemal in uh, spring 1920. However, this letter was not responded for months. Now let us see what the Armenian and Russian uh, relations were like in this stage. 
at the initiative of Soviet Russia in Moscow at the end of uh, May 1920, the Armenian-Russian negotiations uh, were uh, fruitless and they were suspended because the Armenian uh, party uh, in uh, the person of Chichenin and Karahan would propose to take the Armenian issue from the discussions of negotiations of international negotiations, not to trust the empty promises of international states and to realize the threat from the Turkish side. But however, there was no agreement that this was enough for the Kemalist Turkish, uh, Turkic forces to start preparations for a war against Armenia in July, on July 19, 1920, uh, informing about it the Foreign Affairs Minister of Armenia, Chicherin, at the same time uh, tells him that exclusively due to the peaceful uh, inspiration of uh, uh, the Soviet forces, the Turkish uh, forces stopped their conscription that was intended for giving a new blow to the Armenian people. And we do not have any doubt about this, because on the same day, Lenin, uh, Lenin Chicherin and Stalin received a telegram from Orjo Nikidze, who said for sure that the Kemalists have planned, had planned to intrude in uh, summer and to uh, uh, kill Armenians also in uh, Nakhichevan. And this is also confirmed by uh, the leader of uh, Turks, Mustafa Kemal Pasha. On August uh, 14, uh, 1920, he informs the Turkish MPs the Turkish attack against Armenians in June uh, 1920 was really canceled due to the diplomatic intervention of the Soviet state. So it was uh, on at the beginning of August 1920 in the Tbilisi, the Soviet-Armenian negotiations were resumed and this was the last attempt in order to normalize the Armenian and the Russian or Soviet relations in order to take to turn army to tear Armenia from the Western forces, which uh, Russia did not really conceal. The Armenian-Russian a treaty signed in Tiflis uh, again uh, at the expense of certain concessions on the part of Armenia. The Soviet Soviet Russia uh, recognizes the Armenian independent state. However, uh, if uh, Soviet Russia considered the agreement as a counter act. Uh, or to the Treaty of the Sepa, the Armenian government did not give it paramount importance and they considered it a formality and a temporary in nature. The government of Armenia continued to pursue their foreign policy aims and linking it to the Treaty of Sepa. They were really convinced that uh, with the efforts of the powerful European states, it would be realized. And this is quite understandable because uh, how could could we really uh, reject and refuse the idea of a unified and independent Armenia? How could we really uh, get rid of uh, cherished our dream? This is why in the untanned countries, in the pro turkic um, uh, agreement between Armenian and Russia. Uh, the Armenian government uh, called it formality and it seemed that they were trying to justify it and they continued to confirm that they were anti-Bolshevik. Uh, it was a different thing uh, to look at Tetelian's opinion who is a member of the representative um, of the Armenian government in Moscow. He said that because of the enthusiasm created by the Treaty of Sarfa, many of the state and political figures uh, underestimated the role of the Russian state in the solution of the Armenian issue. And they uh, linked too many hopes with the allied powers. Uh, the Armenian uh, delegation thought that the Entente was too far from the frontiers of our state, whereas the military bases uh, and the military regiments of Soviet Russia were already at the frontiers of our state. So the lead head of our negotiation Negotiation team delegation was trying to 
uh, try uh, to persuade, to negotiate with the uh, Russian powers. If Kubihovaneska just only, only even years later really confessed that the uh, Treaty of Sheffer was really, had really confused us and had really uh, faded out our uh, Sense, uh, common sense. However, uh, Juan Carré, who was the president of France and who was the architect of the Treaty of Sèvres, uh, called to be cautious because it was really fragile and maybe it was even a broken vase, so it shouldn't be touched. So, of course, Juan Carré, uh, not only him, uh, who were uh, also those who really determined the destinies of the nations, knew things that ordinary mortals did not really know, because the Treaty of Sèvres was not really milding out, but all was, try was uh, really aggravating the opposition among the countries. And it seems that neither of the signatory uh, states would really uh, believe that the Straits and the Armenia state issues would be realized because they, would, they obviously saw that Russia was not giving in and that Hemalis were not going to admit and to recognize the validity of the Sultan's uh, signature. So the Kemalists who were already working under the nationalist flag and the supporting Bolsheviks did not uh, did, did, did not live under the danger or threat of fights with the Atlantic uh, countries. And uh, the ink had not really dried out. They were trying to really win the heart of the Kemalist uh, Turkey, and they were trying to use this uh, against Russia, once again using Armenia as small change. And even Moreover, uh, before that, uh, the army, uh, the the USA that re uh, agreed, but later rejected the Armenian mandate, and who had not even signed the treaty, uh, was really confined to the historic uh, decision of President Wilson. For Commissar Haskell, on July 24, 1920 wrote a letter to the U.S. Department of State and noted that Armenia is economically and financially helpless. Mr. Wilson can draw the frontiers of Armenia. However, in this part of the world, no one is going to pay attention to it as long as it is not protected with force. So as we already mentioned, the Treaty of Sevka was a major challenge to the to Kemalist Turkey, and it naturally made the Turkish-Armenian war indispensable. So the Kemalists only had to receive the permission and the assistance of Soviet Russia. Hence, we can establish it as a fact that 100 years ago, on the same days, uh, during the summer of 1920, against the Republic of Armenia, uh, there was a war waged, uh, an, an undeclared war waged uh, along the eastern frontiers of Soviet Azerbaijan, and the western frontiers were really endangered by the possible attack from Turkey. So to make a final blow uh, to Armenia and to wipe out Armenia from the regional map, both Turkey and Azerbaijan were uh, diligently asking the agreement of Russia. And we can state as a fact that 100 years later of the mentioned events, we still see the same aspirations cherished by Turkey and Azerbaijan, and West and the West has not really got rid of its policy of isolating and moving Russia out of global politics. Now let us go back again to the events of these days, um, 100 years ago. In mid-July, Bekisamidai led the Kemalist uh, delegation 
uh, and finally, the delegation on August 14 managed to manage uh, managed to meet with Lenin, and they uh, were complaining against the acknowledgement of Armenia and the recognition of it as a state, and also giving the uh, Karsatakh uh, railroad operation to Armenia. Uh, the Turks say that it is the most uh, reliable way of receiving arms from. Uh, to Russia, and if they do not have uh, the operation title to it, they will not be able to extend the global revolution to the West. Uh, of course, the aspirations of the Turkic par Turkish party were uh, officially formulated on August 24th in the initial t uh, Turkish-Russian uh, agreement uh, draft. Uh, and the Kemalist and Bolshevik alliance against Armenia was uh, strengthened by Comintern uh, Executive Committee in, at the beginning of September in Baku within the framework of the first Congress of the Eastern Peoples. And in the protocols of this Congress, it was proposed to solve the issue of the Sovietization of Armenia with the Kemalist forces invading Armenia. And only a few days uh, after the signature of this document, the Kemalist Turkey, uh, with conspiracy, without declaring a war, st launched a large-scale military activity against Armenia. The Kemalists, in fact, enjoyed the decision of the Russian forces to support them. And they were trying to, first of all, to counter the Western forces and to liquidate and neutralize the Treaty of Serfa, and in the case of Armenia, to tear it away from the West, from the West, and also to keep it in the orbit of Russia. So these were the strategic goals. The Armenian state that was abandoned by the Allied powers in 1920, the Turkish-Russian war, uh, had its one of its most decisive uh, losses and defeats, and it officially uh, refused to follow the Treaty of Serfa, and Russia gained Soviet Armenia. In the later years, Soviet uh, Russia and uh, Kemalist Turkey fought against uh, the Sevres Treaty. On uh, March 16, 1921, the Russian-Turkish uh, agreement that was not uh, formal and legal was rejecting the Treaty of Sevres II, and the rejection was adopted also by the Allied powers, who in fact exchanged the Treaty of Selva with Lausanne, where we did not see Armenia anymore. In any case, both the Treaty of Selva and the Armenian-Turkish frontier demarcation, um, New Wilson's uh, award, arbitrary award, uh, have not been implemented yet, but these are documents about the international recognition of the state of Armenia and the independence of the sta uh, nation of Armenia that are impossible to wipe out of the pages of history. So another historic lesson that we can learn from the Treaty of Set, and maybe the most important one perhaps, is that we should never ignore uh, the role and the Russian factor in the region. So the Armenian and the Russian friendly relations, as well as the strategic alliance uh, should be strengthened, and this should be number one foreign policy issue for Armenia, for Armenians, for the present, the incumbent, and the future governments of Armenia. It should contribute to the security and to the peaceful development of our country and our statehood. I think that this is the lesson that we learned from the Treaty of Seven that happened w exactly 100 years ago. So this is one of the decisive lessons that we should learn from these events. So we should not forget that 100 years later, later, uh, 100 years ago, later in autumn, we lost the first statehood, independent statehood of uh, Armenia, the first independent republic, uh, and it was 
really due to the Soviet and the Kemalist collaboration in the conditions of the silence of the Allied power. Thank you very much, Mr. Khajadrian, for this very interesting uh, report. Now we would like to give the floor to Armen Marukian, who is Dr. Professor Academic, uh, uh, who is uh, the head of the Armenian issue and Armenian Genocide History Department of the History Institute of the Academy. And the report is the Treaty of Sevres as one of the legal basis of Armenian demands. Thank you very much, Mr. Savariano, dear colleagues, dear compatriots. Before I pass on to the main topic of the report, I would like to I would like to heartily congratulate uh, the population in the Republic of Armenia, in Artsakh Republic, and in the diaspora on the 100th anniversary of the Treaty of Sevres, because this is one of the major uh, bases and the grounds of our demands, and also Wilson's uh, arbitrary award, as well as the Pan-Armenian Declaration. These are the historic and legal grounds for our demands. So speaking about uh, the claims, and if we consider the terms and the clauses of the Treaty of Sefab, there are four major um, misconceptions that I would like to address in my report. So the Armenian history, uh, historical studies during the uh, recent two decades, especially during the Soviet times, focused on uh, the on articles 88 nine, uh, to 93. However, I will show, and I think that Mr. Merkonian in his report also said, that apart from these articles, the Treaty of Sev also contained a very important other articles where, however, we do not have the words Armenia or Armenians directly, but they uh, also have to do with the violation of the rights of Armenians due to the genocide. The second point is Wilson's arbitrary award and Article 99 of the Treaty of Seville and uh, the correlation between the two. There are a number uh, there are a number of Turkish specialists who say that Wilson's arbitrary award uh, is derived from uh, the uh, from Article 18 of the Treaty of Sevres, and they also state that it was since it was not ratified and uh, did not take any legal power, uh, also renders Wilson's award also illegal. And unfortunately, uh, many Armenian authors speak about this too, and we'll speak. Uh, we will address this. The third issue that was largely highlighted in the Armenian history studies is the idea of the exchange of uh, the Treaty of Sevres with the Treaty of Lausanne. However, this is not true at all. And I will show in my report that these are completely different documents. And even though there are certain things that were also raised in the Treaty of Lausanne. And lastly, that the Treaty of uh, Sèvres is just a historical document and it does not have anything to do with the present times. This is something we'll discuss too. So when we speak about the Treaty of Sèvres, we already said that Articles 88 to 93, first of all, established Turkey, Turkey would uh, recognize the free and independent statehood of Armenia, by the way, as it was already done by Allied powers. By the way, it was established that all the states that signed the Treaty of Sèvres had already recognized the Republic of Armenia as a free and independent state. So this is a very important fact to establish. And in relation to Article 89, it was already mentioned that uh, the three vilayets of Western Armenia, the major, major part of Erzurum, uh, two-third of Bitlis, and one-third of Trabzon, 
would be transferred or were envisaged to be transferred to the First Republic of Armenia. And in relation to this Article 88, there is something that is worthwhile to take note of because the next article, Article 90, seems to come to complement the content of Article 89. And it says that Turkey uh, refuses from uh, uh, all rights and title over the territory of Armenia, and it says that the Republic of Armenia should take over the obligations of the Ottoman Empire in relation to this territory, and a reference is made to Article 241 to 244. These are the articles about the old debt of the Ottoman Empire. What does this mean? This means that handing over these territories to Armenia, there's Roman, Bitlis, and Thraps on one third territory. Uh, obligations that were before borne by the Ottoman Empire were now relayed on to the Republic of Armenia. This is a very important fact because the Republic of Armenia taking over these territories would also assume the former liabilities and obligations of the empire. By the way, in terms of Trabzon, it should be noted that Article 352 comes to complement Article 89. This is an important article where we already have the word Armenia and it says that some part of the Trabzon port forever will be transferred to the Republic of Armenia so that the uh, Republic of Armenia is able to ensure its right to access the sea. And also, it was envisaged to create a mixed committee with the representatives of Armenia. Turkey and the League of Nations, and uh, this committee was supposed to determine uh, the um, issue of the amount of rental uh, and lease of this territory, as well as the order of its operation. That is to say, the issue of the right of Armenians enjoying the traps on port was not left for the uh, Turkish state to determine, but rather a mixed composition committee would determine this issue. Apart from our right and title to uh, trap on port, uh, Mr. Melkonian also said that there is Article 351, where once again we have the mention of Armenia, which states that along with Georgia, Azerbaijan, and uh, Persia, Armenia will also have free access to the Batumi port. So once again, we have a situation where we would have two Black Sea ports, both Batumi and Trabzon, where we could have free access and free use rights. So I think that we should all agree that uh, having two points of access to Black Sea, uh, not just one, would really facilitate the dire socioeconomic situation of Armenia. It was already mentioned that Article 92 was about the frontier issues between Armenia and Azerbaijan. It was noted that uh, the concerned parties were supposed to have discussions with each other and to solve the frontier issues. And if they did not succeed, and they would not most likely, because our neighbors were aspiring and had ambitions for our uh, territories, and some territories were already considered disputable. And here we spoke about both Zakhijev and Artsat Zangezo and the neutral territory of Lori. The decision of these uh, matters would be transferred under the mandate of the winning states. So once again, they were supposed to make decisions on this matter. It is really important to consider Article 93 too, because it states that we may within the term of three months, when this territory was transferred to Armenia, a frontier uh, committee was supposed to be created who would really establish these frontiers and naturally, because because the treaty itself was not ratified, no new committee was created. Article 93, which is the last one in the series, establishes that the Republic of Armenia assumes liability to 
the um, obligation to ensure the protection of the rights uh, and the interests of the inhabitants who, dif uh, who differ from the majority of the population in race, language, or religion. So, of course, an assumption was made that uh, Turkish and Kurdish uh, uh, population was going, to live, uh, was going to live in these territories, and Armenia was undertaking an obligation to protect their interests and their rights. So this is just one block of the treaty itself. But apart from this, I think we want to restrict it to uh, arbitrarily or conventional court um, block two uh, could uh, be also named the block that has to do with the socioeconomic uh, rights protection. Uh, in Article 125, it was noted that the territories that were being separated uh, from Turkey and the inhabitants who were subject to the Ottoman Empire were free to choose their citizenship. So this is really important, an important article, which means that uh, the <laughs> Armenian population, the fragments of the population who had survived uh, the devastating genocide in the Western Armenia, as well as our uh, compatriots who were living in the Arabic territories, could freely choose the, uh, their, the their citizenship as being citizens of the Republic of Armenia, and regardless of where they lived, they could enjoy Armenian citizenship. Article 142 was noted too, but I would like to make a major and a very important point. So uh, sentence one of Article 142 states uh, that, including the state of Turkey, uh, considers that since November 1st, Nine, uh, that is to say, ever since 1914, ever since the Turkish state stepped into war, uh, the power established in this state is terroristic. That is, this is something very important because this is a political evaluation, something Mr. Safrasyan said, and this was a political evaluation to the Young Turks regime. So this is something that was signed by the Turkish state, that is to say the people who were authorized by the Sultan. They also admitted that the regime that was in power in this uh, the state since 1914 was terroristic, and here we conclude that during the war years there were forced Muslim Muslimization actions and that this terroristic regime uh, conducted this Muslimization, Islamization uh, activities and the former Christians or formerly Christians were allowed to uh, come back, to be reconverted to the old um, faith. So also uh, this gave a possibility to free uh, and to set free to release people who were kidnapped, who were enslaved, and to return them to their place of residence. We know that during the uh, war and genocide years, many Armenian women and girls were kidnapped and abducted, and they were being sexually abused. And uh, the same is true about uh, tens of thousands of Armenian orphans who were again enslaved, and they were being abused in uh, different Turks and Kurds houses, or they were trained and educated as Turks in Turkish orphanage. So these clauses of Article 142 were again about this um, remedy, and this was not really entrusted. The, the, the Turkish state was not entrusted with this process again, and a mixed composition of a committee was supposed to be established, uh, again, with a representative of the League of nations in order to ensure the establishment and the implementation of this article. I think that this is really important for us, too, in terms of uh, restoring our violated rights. And Article 144 is really important uh, in the, from the perspective of fight against the confiscated property of Armenia. So the law, the, the so-called law of abandoned property was considered repealed. It was considered illegal. And uh, the state, um, the Turkish state was 
obliged not to pass such laws anymore. So to remind, we would like to say that this was the law uh, which, along with the genocide, ensured the confiscation and the seizure of uh, the property owned by Armenians, by uh, Muslims, and by the Turkish state. And we should not doubt to say that as a result of the committees, committees uh, uh, the property was the, the, prop, uh, the, 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 the property that was seized and confiscated by uh, Armenians, and not only Armenians, also Syrians, uh, Jewish, and Greek people, uh, and uh, became the, ground, the, the foundation of the economic growth of Turkey as a state. And here, the uh, committee was again to be created to determine the mechanisms on the return of this property. And once again, the Turkish uh, different um, nation representatives and the nation of league representatives should come into a committee. And whenever a decision was made or a revelation was made that the property was owned by an Armenian, not by a Turk or a Kurd, immediately this property was to be returned uh, regardless of of uh, whether uh, this uh, illegal uh, illegal uh, ownership was supposed to be to be sold. That is to say, those owners who had lost their property during the years of genocide did not have any obligation. So I cannot say that this Article 142, if we just change the leg of nations by a UN, is quite an operant mechanism in order to make sure that Armenia's uh, material property is uh, implement uh, the right to this property is restored if, of course, the cadastre documents are um, found and we re-establish who were the old and the former owners were. So uh, it should be recorded that regardless of citizenship, all Ottoman sub empire subjects should become once again the owners and the masters of their property and uh, their citizenship uh, should not be any hindrance if these people have the documents establishing their ownership over the property. Why am I saying this? Because uh, the former Ottoman subjects who were being rejected their citizenship, in fact, from the legal perspective, uh, could not have their rights violated. That is to say that the Citizenship Deprivation Act, according to uh, the, the Treaty of Safa, did not create any grounds for such an action. And the third block, so it is about the war criminals and uh, the represent and those who were in charge of the genocide. So this was about punishing these entities uh, within the framework of the Paris Peace Co uh, Conference. A special committee was created to punish war criminals. And because uh, the international law specialists from 15 uh, countries participated in it, in the committee. It was called Committee 15, and they raised the issue of uh, the uh, requirement of the International Tribunal Justice uh, over war criminals, and uh, the uh, empire, uh, emperor of Germany was supposed to, uh, emperor of Austria was supposed to be the head of this committee. However, the countries of Antwerp were not really consistent. However, in 20, Article 226, 228 uh, were established in the uh, Treaty of Sefa, and if 226, 228 were about uh, holding accountable and responsible uh, the Turkish uh, authorities, to Article 238 is really unique because no other treaty uh, signed ever since World War One is unique because no such formulation is incorporated because this article establishes that not only uh, 
war criminals uh, should be handed over uh, by the Turkish authorities to the justice of the winning powers, but also all those persons who participated in the massacres and in the atrocities in the territories which, as of August 1st, 1914, were part uh, were an indivisible part of the Ottoman Empire. This means that the Turkish authorities, for example, were in charge of uh, the camps in the Syrian deserts and were in charge of, uh, and they could not really uh, avoid the handing over of the responsible authorities uh, for the massacres and atrocities of tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of Armenians. So naturally, those people who were uh, implementing these massacres and atrocities in this territory were uh, to be uh, extradited to the international justice bodies. It should be noted that later, uh, the committee to study the war crimes on uh, May 28, 1946, establishes that this is exactly what was the in the foundation of point C of Nuremberg and uh, Tokyo. Uh, so this was a case law event. So we could see how multi-profile and diverse the Treaty of Savoy is, and this is not confined to the articles that directly head to us. As for Wilson's arbitral award and uh, the correla its correlation with Article 89, it should be noted that in general, the arbitrage uh, issue, especially in relation to territorial issues, should be agreed upon by the parties of the uh, disputing of the dispute. That is to say, we should have a compromise when a compromise uh, telling that they give the dispute resolution and the decision to. Uh, an arbitrage or to an arbiter. So the compromise is Article 89 uh, of August 10 Treaty itself. However, this Turkish specialist forget that this was not just a mere frontier dispute. So this was the establishment of the political will and the issue of exercising the right to victory, which also was linked to very grievous international crime, uh, the genocide of Armenia. And this compromise was uh, signed not on August 10, but in San Ramon, uh, April 25, 26. And after that, they officially turned to the president of USA, Woodrow Wilson, who, as a lawyer by profession, and before being a president, a person who used to practice law, on May 17, gave his agreement. Now a question rises. Uh, doesn't Wilson realize that the compromise was not August 10 already, but rather the political will of the winning states when they ask him to be the arbiter in this case when he agreed? That is to say, if compromise is August 10, so it's not clear why the arbiter had already given has the agreement and if this agreement or the compromise has not happened yet. So if we are to be led by this logic in the case of non-ratification of the Treaty of Sèvres, for Wilson, uh, the arbiter will, should not have uh, put forth the uh, award. But as we know, on November 26, the award was issued, and this establishes that the president of USA, Woodrow Wilson, was not in any way restricted by the signing or no signing of the Treaty of Sèvres. And the Treaty of Sèvres, this compromise of, uh, that is to say, the political will of the victorious states was joined by a number of other countries, including disputing parties, Turkey and Armenia. But once again, I would like to reiterate that apart from this circumstance, this was a separate and individual international process, and it was supposed to run its course and concluded apart from or regardless of uh, the Treaty of Sèvres. As for Lausanne, I will try to conclude quickly now and very briefly. Uh, when does a treaty come to replace another one? When the signatories of the same uh, of this treaty are the same as the signatories 
territories of the previous one, and if they officially declare that we have convened in order to change or uh, revisit the clauses. By the way, something of the kind happened during the Paris conference when truly the same states came together in order to revisit uh, the Treaty of Sanwa because certain uh, political and geographical situations have changed. Uh, Mr. Hajira said uh, there was Bolshevik and Kemalist romance happening, but as we know in London conference since the Turks uh, rejected and denied the idea of national cradle. Uh, this was a very decisive uh, mistake, and in, the, in Lausanne, no revision of the Treaty of Sanfa happened. And if they were more reasonable, and if uh, really agreed to this hearth of nation uh, concept, then the Sefa would be uh, restricted. However, this did not happen, whereas Lausanne, Lausanne is a completely different treaty. First of all, the signatories are different. So the Republic of Armenia has not signed uh, the Lausanne uh, Treaty and is not in any way obliged to live up to it. And the subject of the treaty is completely different. The SEF was losing the issues on the conclusion of World War I and was also uh, establishing the fact of the defeat of the Ottoman Empire, whereas the Lausanne was about uh, Greek and Turkey, uh, Greece and Turkey, and also uh, the frontiers of uh, West and South, and the international recognition of the Kemalists as the legal successors of the Turkish uh, power. Before that, nothing of the kind had ever happened. And when we compare the treaties of Sevres and Lausanne, we see that both the subject and the signatories of both treaties are completely different, and this is not, they're not identical. They cannot, uh, one did not come to, to replace the other one. And simply, Lausanne was signed to once again and re-ratify certain clauses of uh, the uh, Treaty of Sevres. And in fact, uh, the Kemalists adopted uh, and agreed to some of uh, the clauses for Kurdistan. And uh, we can conclude that the Treaty of Sevres was partially uh, applied implemented and applied uh, document. It's not simply historical document, because the Arabic states considered the Treaty of Sèvres as the foundation and the ground of their separation. And this process happened before the Treaty of Lausanne was signed. And the Treaty of Lausanne came to proofread or to reestablish the Treaty of uh, Sèvres. In Article 18, uh, just very uncertainly states that apart from the separation of this Turkish territory, no other uh, frontier disputes should be uh, determined uh, based on special agreements stemming from uh, goodwill. So it shouldn't be a treaties, but special arrangements, so to say. That is to say, uh, according to Moscow and Kars, we had already lost, solved this issue, and that is why it was not incorporated in Lausanne, does not really stand as a valid point, because I think that uh, the Western states understand that the Bolshevik and the Kemalist agreement that were not perceived as such by the Western countries uh, could not really uh, have it as a uh, a legal document influencing the Lausanne Treaty. But we can really understand the sp special arrangement uh, under the mandate of the arbitration uh, in terms of the determination of Wilson's arbitral award. And it is not accidental that uh, both in Alexandropol uh, they uh, brought in uh, certain law clauses and Moscow and Kars agreements and treaties uh, really had a role to play here. However, we can say that the Treaty of Sèvres, as of now, has not lost its topicality because it served as ground and foundation for many developments. And uh, the USA and Japan and uh, 
uh, they do not have a peace treaty, and they can. This can be complement to the San Francisco Treaty, and similarly, uh, in the presence of political will, any country, any state who signed the Treaty of Sèvres can make this political decision and can ratify this document, which can be followed by other states, which could be a new challenge uh, for the state of Turkey because the severophobia is still there in the Republic of Turkey as of today. And Mr. Hofsefian will speak about this. Thank you, Mr. Marukian, for your very interesting and very well-grounded uh, presentation. And now we would like to give the floor to Levon Hofsefian, who is senior researcher at the Turkey Department of the Oriental Studies Institute of the Academy. And the topic is uh, the ghost of Sefa 100 years later, the syndrome of Sefa in the modern Turkic uh, socio-political discourse. Thank you. Thank you very much, dear colleagues. In this report, I'm not going to speak about the historical and the legal aspects of the Treaty of Sèvres, but I will speak about something really important, the political mindset in Turkey around this event, as well as the influence on the collective memory and the current manifestations of it in the contemporary politic, socio-political discourse in Turkey. Currently, the syndrome of Sèvres is really largely applied in the population which reflects the perceptions that uh, they uh, still understand it as a danger and as a fear of further dismemberment of Turkey. The Tanzimati syndrome, Balkan syndrome terms are also used in this discourse. However, collectively, they can be put under the headline of Sèvres syndrome. syndrome. For years, studying the manifestations of Sever syndrome, we can establish that it is not only the collective societal consciousness part, uh, but also part of the political culture, uh, the global political and security identity element, which not only determines the internal and the external us and them concepts, but also determines uh, the uh, foreign policy pursuits. Even though the dismemberment uh, Panic and fear have always been uh, with uh, the political leadership that have been the witnesses uh, of time and the collapse of the Ottoman Empire. However, in different times, the military and the authorities have constantly kept the ghost of the Treaty of Sèvres alive or another factor which we could say uh, which is embodied by uh, saying in Turkey stating that Turkey is encircled on three sides by seas and by four sides and uh, by enemies of four sides and uh, the socio-political circles have been haunted by these fears throughout the existence of the Republic of Turkey and this has turned into a paranoid uh, paranoid in uh, Turkey due to objective and subjective factors. Objective because the Republic of Turkey was declared on the uh, rubble of the Ottoman Empire and the forefathers of the Republic were the early witnesses of the Ottoman times and this uh, influence later turned into strategic thinking which was mostly with a uh, subject uh, income with the government and with the military leadership and the bureaucracy and the different leadership entities have constantly imposed fear and the potential repetition of the past on the society aiming at uh, the public and social mobilization and uh, subjection of the society because of external fear. 
uh, in order to pursue different political uh, courses. I would like also to speak about different factors that feed the Sever syndrome, and we can classify them into two major groups, internal and external. In the external factor, here we see the West and the Western conspiracy, neighboring states, uh, Greece, Syria, Armenia, Armenian issue, and the international recognition of the Armenian genocide. In the internal group, we have the Kurdish issue, ethnic uh, minorities, and traditionally, mm, it's very stereotypical concept in, our, in uh, Turkey, the uh, concept the factor of the internal enemy. The Sever syndrome is very typical of different political and ideological uh, forces, uh, leftists, uh, rightists, Kemalists, uh, Islamists. So in different times, uh, the subject sub objectification of the syndrome happened by different forces, and these forces and players have fed it for different approaches. Initially, it was uh, the political and the military elite, uh, those uh, were the subjects who were acting under the Kemalist flag, and later it was the pro-Islamist conservatives who were quite acutely anti-Western, and then once again the Kemalist uh, political and military apparatus, and once again the pro-Islamist and conservative uh, incumbent power. So it is really interesting to see the Erdogan's uh, Erdo to see Erdogan's approach. So coming to power, Erdogan's power has adopted a certain liberal uh, course at the early years of its government, of its ruling. We're taking steps in order to get rid of different taboos and stereotypes of the Kemalist uh, times, uh, also in relation to the Treaty of Safa, trying to unload uh, the the mentality of the so-called uh, the loads and the burden of the past. That is to say, in this context, the syndrome of SEV was seen as the as the credo that had constantly uh, militarized and politicized uh, the Turkish regime. However, later, sometime later, the Justice and Development uh, Party and its leader Erdogan became not only uh, the new uh, security regime uh, architect for Turkey, but also they took the syndrome of Sev onto a different level, and they already established the so uh, the in inverted commas, the freedom and independence war to be waged and also to create, uh, to, to free Turkey from the contemporary cons conspiracies. So in Istanbul, the university created, a, uh, a survey, uh, conducted a survey and 87% of the respondents of the stated that the European countries, just like the Ottoman Empire, would like to dismember Turkey and over 73% of the response said that uh, the reforms uh, proposed by the EU were similar uh, to the clauses of the Treaty of Sefa. These trends became to become very, uh, very marked in 2013, as well as uh, during the uh, against the background of the RICU and uh, the aggravation of anti-Western and and. Uh, Spirit. So, for example, it is noted that in case the Treaty of Sa uh, in case these developments happened, it would be dismembered because uh, dismembered because of the uh, as it would in case of the Treaty of Sava. In Turkey's Belagic uh, region, for example, in one of his speeches, the uh, leader also called to the Turkish population to get ready to the second fight for independence. So the, the drawing parallels with the historic past, the current time was, uh, was compared to the Ottoman uh, times, uh, speaking about the Ottoman Empire dismemberment. Uh, he thought that the Tur Turkish state is now facing the Armenian issue and the Kurdish issue and that they were going to the dismemberment and they should start the new national freedom uh, war. So this was the, the, in 1987, uh, the president of Kenan, Evren, uh, 
as a statement in relation to the European Parliament discussion of the Armenian issue, and this was a come to complement to this announcement, because uh, there were used there used to be uh, Eastern uh, 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 there used to be Armenians in the eastern regions of the country to give these territories back to uh, back to them. So we have both external and internal factors here. So the first one is because of the. Uh, of such processes of courses that are happening internally, such as the Kurdish issue, the world and Islam uh, confrontation, and the general crisis. Uh, and the second one is about the external forces whose policy to Turkey is uh, perceived to be as conspiracy because and a new plan to dismember and to collapse the, Tur the Turkish state because it is not in line with the interests of Turkey. So here we speak about both uh, the influence of the Armenian issue and the recognition of the Armenian uh, gen genocide. So we can say that the dismemberment, or in other words, the Sevre syndrome has also anti-Kurdish uh, uh, trend, and depending on the period of time and the processes, it is anti-Greek too. So in many cases, it is very often associated with these issues. However, it has a multi-layer. I spoke about the Tanzibar syndrome, which can also uh, be part of the Sanford syndrome. Here we speak about the issues that minorities have, as well as the reforms of the country. Turkish uh, commentator and publicist Iman Chen said that the generations in Turkey have been raised with uh, complexes that the Western states have never refused the idea of dismembering Turkey, turning them into Turkish, Kurdish, and Ar Kurdic and Armenian territories. And this perception is there both at political and public uh, uh, levels. Elf Chafak also said that uh, in Turkey, everyone was raised in the conditions of self syndrome, that the country is always surrounded by uh, enemies. And Akhil said that every Turk is, lives in the shadow of the Sevre as national fear lives uh, living with it. As Danish uh, researcher Jung says that unlike Sevre, the, the signing of the Treaty of Lausanne uh, and the recognition of Turkey Turkey as an independent state, it was not the self was not forgotten by the elite of the country. Uh, so they say that it is uh, a myth and it is very much based on the conspiracy that have been promoted in the in the society of Turkey. According to one of the publicists of Turkey, decades later, uh, or in, after the self the vision is still uh, seen in the Turkish society. Now, we should say that Mr. Safrastian also spoke about uh, the self syndrome, actually, and I would like to speak a bit more about its current manifestations. Unlike the past and uh, the I like the ways of feeding this syndrome of, by the previous uh, authorities, which was largely about protection or prevention. Uh, the Erdogan style of feeding this has mostly uh, attacking nature and according to which the panic of dismemberment is becoming aggressive and is taken onto aggressive plane. And in this case, we have a paradoxical situation where the forces, where the power are largely presenting the idea and the feeding the idea of conspiracy and feeding the fear. And on the other hand, we see very aggressive uh, activity by Turkey that are destabilizing uh, the in different uh, the, the destabilizing different regions in 2017 speaking about the new liberal uh, being in a new liberation war Erdogan says quote in case Turkey fails they're going to open up the failed uh, Treaty of Sèvres for Turkey, so uh, end of quote. So this manifestation and different re refer references to this are there in the in mass media and in general societal and public discourse. In uh, we're speaking about the uh, eastern and also Mediterranean Sea regions. Erdogan uh, speaks uh, about the political developments and says that there were plans that they were not taken into consideration the interests of Turkey and they were being forced by Western for Western powers and. Uh, 
Turkey really neutralized it. He, he quote, uh, there, are, uh, there is imposition here, imposure here. However, we have neutralized them and we have taken steps and we uh, countered uh, and we did just the opposite, end of quote. So it is not accidental that along with the activization of this conspiracy, he started also to uh, circulate uh, the necessity of the Treaty of Lausanne and also the frontiers of the national oath. And these are manifestations of the Turkish paradox. And on the one hand, we see very actively seeing the circulation of the server syndrome, the dismemberment syndrome. And on the other hand, not only at the level of discourse, but also in the policy, foreign policy and the security policy, we see this revisionist and very ambitious activities. And in this context, it is quite interesting to note, only days ago, uh, the French Le Monde uh, periodical uh, published an interesting article where uh, in the Mediterranean uh, region, Erdogan is really taking revenge on the Treaty of Sevres 100 years uh, later. Uh, an active publicist, Igor Ibrahim Karagul, uh, immediately wrote an article on this, stating that, a quote, 100 years ago, the Ottoman Empire was being dismembered by France, and now France is now losing to uh, Turkey right now, meaning the Eastern Mediterranean. Uh, <laughs> conflict in the between the in the context of t Turkey and France which is a uh, proof to what extent the map of forces has changed so the perceptions of 100 years ago and the revenge statements are not wrong however the political mindset of Turkey is now closing the parentheses of 100 years ago and now we do not hear anything from those who used to speak about Sefra for years and and now we see that quite interesting developments are happening and we see the aggressive conduct of Turkey in a number of directions and in general the foreign policy and the security policies we see this revengeful and the revisionist trends but at the same time we also see Erdogan being able to synthesize and to play with uh, the concept of being um, uh, under the fear and the peril of dismemberment on the other hand we we see the expansion ideology, which Erdogan says uh, whatever is happening in Iraq and Syria is the historic mission of Turkey, which, stem from, uh, which stems from uh, the national oath. In Turkish foreign relations, uh, the, so the treaty uh, of Sevres that is put on shelves and is taken out every time when Whenever it is an expedient moment, as the Turkish political figures name it, uh, still co is, co is haunting the political and the military circles in Turkey, and because they realize that they could be taken accountable and responsible for the cleansing of Armenians and the destruction of the minorities, uh, as well as. Uh, the other factors that have laid the foundations of the Republic of Armenia. And these foundations are really very fragile and they're really being haunted by the panic and the nightmare, as Kemal Atatürk said, continuous nightmare continue to be haunting the social, political and public circles of this country. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Hovsepian. This was our last present uh, report. It was very interesting report, report too. Uh, to conclude, I would like to thank our, all our speakers because every single one of them has looked at the topic of Sevres from an important perspective and in its integrity we can see what content the the Treaty of Sèvres had and what were the political and the uh, 
what was the political context that uh, caused the failure of it. However, we saw a few lessons. So first of all, our neighbor and the state of Azerbaijan created by it are not going to reconcile with the idea that we are going to have an Armenian state or Armenian states, independent states. So everything was done by Turkey in order to make sure that at the beginning of the 20th century, no independent Armenian state was formed. And the organization of genocide was just one of those steps. So Turkey feels that time had come for the destruction of empires. And after the destruction of empires, the colonies or the colonized states were really aspiring for independence. And Armenians had uh, best uh, advantages, both demographic, education, and economic and in order to get convinced in this concept we can study and we can familiarize ourselves with the materials uh, which in 2019 which in 1920 uh, were given to Woodrow Wilson for him to make his arbitral award that Armenians uh, played a dominant role in this territory and they were always ready to restore their independent state and later this course was pursued after Sevres too, and I do not think that it was accidental that the Bolsheviks, uh, the, that uh, cheating the Bolsheviks with their communist future, Turkey was able to receive gold, to receive arms, and attack Armenia. That is to say, they reduced, they destroyed the f power which after the mapping of, uh, which after Wilson's mapping of frontiers could really happen. So this is a historical fact. And the next lesson is perhaps, uh, is that we should not really stagger in the whirlpool of the different world powers. We should always pursue our own national interest, and in this context, our uh, political and our diplomatic thought, schools, and practice should need long prospects and long-term perspectives in order to understand how different powers would behave in different global political developments. If we had such orientations and we had a possibility to foresee the political developments, maybe we would find different solutions to our problems, our issues. The next lesson to be learned is that it is really important for all political institutes of public administration uh, government, church, etc., oh, were supposed to be extremely unified in the solution of issues that related to national interests. We should not forget that we lost our state at four times at the beginning of the fifth century in the Bagratuni dynasty, Cilicia, and the First Republic. And for the fifth time, it would even be really uh, awkward to speak about that. We cannot afford it. And all possible steps need to be taken in order to make sure that political institutions are unified and consolidated in national interests, not to allow uh, different forces, centrifugal forces, to activate. And only it is in this case, in the presence of uh, national forces we and in the unification of forces we could really uh, make sure the implementation of several treaty uh, which unfortunately was not implemented but as the speaker said it still has a future i was very happy also to listen to what Mr. Khachapryan and Mr. Marukyan said about Soviet histori uh, historiography uh, and also to speak about the mistakes in terms of our national uh, interest. If you open the encyclopedia of the Soviet Armenia, you would see that Lausanne really replaced uh, the Treaty of Sevres. But Mr. Marukyan showed that that's not true, and especially the emphasis that before Lausanne in 19, uh, 
we had Kars and Moscow, and we did not uh, have to speak about Lausanne immediately. So I would like to extend my word of satisfaction and gratitude to Mr. Safrastian, Mr. Hovsepian, and Mr. Melkonian in relation to their reports. Thank you very much for this high-level presentation of the matter. And I think that our public were aware of what was happening in Serbia and why uh, and what are the geographical and political threats for the Treaty of Sèvres and in this context and for our future that we will be able to confront. I would like to thank the report, the presenters. I would like to thank journalists who will cover uh, who covered this conference. Thanks to all those who ensured the broad live broadcast. Thanks to all.